I'm the CEO of PMD Alliance, and it's always a treat when I get to be with you guys. Um, it is so nice to be able to see you in your homes and connect as best as we can during this time. Um, so great question, Maria. This is about a variety of different things. One of them is exercising. But um, what we're going to talk about today is Dr. Hermanowitz um, has uh, some four key uh, tips to living well with Parkinson's disease. And I'm going to go so far as to say I think it applies to not just the person with the disease, but also the care partner um, to, who's also living with Parkinson's disease. It is absolutely an honor to be able to be doing this with Dr. Hermanowitz. He is um, one of our physician advisors, has been for years, and he used to, he actually started and ran the um, Parkinson's program at University of California in Irvine. And now he lives in Santa Fe and is offering movement disorder services in Santa Fe at St. Vincent's. So he's also um, published many, many articles, uh, research articles. Um, in fact, we've done an article with him and that has that's absolutely a joy. Um, and he is a you know, nationally, internationally known speaker and we are just really fortunate to hear from him today. And when he, after he's done talking, we're gonna hear from Karen St. Clair and Dave Orlowski, who are gonna share just a little bit about some of the things they've done, because I think we can learn from each other and um, tips and tricks and you know experience that we've had that have helped navigate this. So we're gonna hear from everybody and then it's gonna be an interactive time. So as usual, we welcome you to put questions, comments, thoughts, um, anything in the chat that we can reply to and I'll keep track of those. The chat, if you are new to this, is in the bottom, uh, kind of middle, and you can just type it in there. And if you have a question that you want to send to me personally and privately, you can do that and I will share that um, question with the doctor or Karen or Dave. And uh, the last piece is if you are looking at this and all you see is my big face and you wanna see all of the boxes of people and not just the speaker, um, in the top right corner, you can click on the view and you can go between gallery view and um, the uh, speaker view. So um, we are recording this, so you will be able to watch this later and share it with all of your friends. It's a great thing that might be helpful for support groups to share as well. So I am not going to talk anymore because we have a lot to cover and I am going to turn this over to Dr. Hermanowitz. Thank you. Uh, again, very nice to uh, participate in the program. Uh, nice to see everybody. Um, I do have four points that I often bring up early in the diagnosis of uh, people who and partners uh, who are living with Parkinson's disease, often at the first visit, uh, certainly by the second. Um, you know, as, as a physician treating people with Parkinson's disease, my role is uh, not just uh, talking about medications or uh, invasive uh, procedures like deep brain stimulation uh, surgery, uh, but really to give an overview of what's, what is the optimal care of uh, somebody that has Parkinson's disease. What should they be thinking about, uh, not just about medication? So the, the first point is the judicious use of medication. And that really falls a, a great deal on, on my shoulders in terms of having a conversation with my patient, their care partner about what kind of symptoms are particularly troubling to them. Uh, is medication even uh, indicated at this point or not? Um, there are a lot of options to uh, choose from in terms of selecting a medication. And in Parkinson's disease, I think more than anything else I see in, in terms of neurology, one size does not fit all. Uh, there is no uh, formulaic approach. And I've written a couple of articles and chapters on the treatment of Parkinson's disease over the course of my career. And uh, people very often, both colleagues and patients, want to have a formula approach, and there is no such thing. Uh, it really does uh, it, it involve engaging the patient, their care partner, in terms of what are their priorities, uh, what are their concerns, and then uh, selecting the medication and then being familiar, and that again is pr primarily my role, being familiar with what the medications can do and what they cannot do, along with what the potential side effects are. And that's a discussion I have with everybody when we're talking about use of medication. Um, 
And that's what I mean by judicious, you know, selecting a medication that one is a dose adequate that's going to be beneficial to the person, not using a dose that's too low and certainly not too high that exceeds you know, what is necessary for them. And thinking about what are the possible side effects, the frequency of dosing and so forth. So using things judiciously, I think is uh, of primary importance. Along with that, however, it's not just about using a medication. There are other things brought up already that are, I think, essential in terms of optimal outcomes or optimal uh, quality of life issues in people who are living with Parkinson's along with their care partners, and that would include exercise. Uh, I think in the, in the time of my training, this was not adequately addressed or emphasized. It's not it was neglected entirely, but I think over the past certainly 10, maybe 15 years, uh, this has been recognized as being an important ingredient in terms of keeping people optimally uh, Mobile. Uh, uh, there are uh, publications in the past that look at things like cognitive status or mood uh, that can respond to uh, regular exercise. So having some exercise program that is integral to the treatment program is essential. Uh, we don't know yet what the optimal exercise is for all people with Parkinson's disease. There was a review some years ago by Lisa Schulman, who's at the University of Maryland, looking at exercise publications of a variety of types, everything from weightlifting to Tai Chi. And it seemed that this was, you know, some of the, the optimal exercise was a combination of something aerobic, something that gets your heart rate up a little bit, and also uh, muscle strengthening or toning of muscles. Um, but in any case, whatever it is, whether it's walking or stationary bike or rowing or whatever you like to do, uh, I think it's important that that be uh, recognized and incorporated in terms of optimal treatment of people who are living with Parkinson's disease. A third topic I bring up is the issue of social connection, which is, gosh, it's been so much harder these days with this pandemic, that being socially connected, I think is important. Uh, it saddens me at times when I see patients uh, who are becoming socially isolated. Prior to the pandemic, I saw this with some frequency, people pulling back for whatever reason. Um, I, I didn't query people about exactly why, at least on a regular basis. I did sometimes ask people, why are they not meeting with their friends as they used to? Part of it is that the friends aren't calling as they used to, I'm sorry to say. Uh, and I think that is a certain awkwardness in terms of how does one interact? Um, people themselves with this diagnosis are occasionally pulling back. And one of the reasons I've heard quite often is the tremor. I always found that kind of puzzling. Uh, uh, the, the tremor, unfortunately, tends to come out even more so in social situations, even happy uh, social situations, not necessarily stressful circumstances. Uh, and people are self-conscious about the tremor. Uh, and understandably so. I found this puzzling because throughout the course of my training when I was a fellow and, and earlier in my career, one would read or be taught that the tremor doesn't really cause a lot of disability. You know, people are able to eat, they're able to dress, they're able to do what they need to do with the tremor. Uh, when I was in my last job, I did a survey of about 200 people asking them what troubled them most about having Parkinson's disease. And tremor was like number one on the list. They, they really didn't like it. There was another study I saw by Ira Scholson, who's now in, in uh, Washington, D.C., was at the University of Rochester for years. Uh, he used even a larger, huge database. I think he looked at thousands of people through the Fox Foundation. And once again, he presented these results last year at the Parkinson's uh, study group meeting. Tremor was high in the list of things that people with this diagnosis really don't like. And I suspect that, uh, to a great extent, is keeping people home more than they should be. You know, I think, you know, I, I tell people, we're like Labrador dogs. You know, we, we like to be with groups of people. We had a couple of labs in the past, and it was, it was so tormenting to them if we had people over to visit and we would put them away in a bedroom or something, because they wanted to meet everybody uh, and make friends with everybody. And I think that's essential to our own well-being, not as laboratories, but as human beings, that we have these kinds of social connections. A, a, a fourth uh, component, I, which I think is also essential, is intellectual engagement. Uh, keeping the wheels turning, uh, that use it or lose it uh, kind of concept. There are studies that we've probably talked about in the past that show that people with Parkinson's disease who engage in regular 
cognitive exercise uh, do better with their cognitive skills. Uh, it does have a positive beneficial effect upon them. Uh, this has not been studied quite so rigorously, for example, like medications, but this idea of using your brain, talking about whatever topic is of interest to you, meeting with other people, not just the social engagement, but the intellectual exchange as well, uh, use, using those wheels that otherwise are going to get rusty if you don't. I think that's one of the great benefits, uh, frankly, of things like Rock City Boxing, which has been hugely popular, certainly in Southern California, and also here in Santa Fe, that it's, it's exercise combined with social activity, and I think probably also some intellectual engagement or exchange in the people who are participants in Rock City Boxing. So I, I think those are the four foremost things. There's a fifth one that, that probably I don't discuss enough and, and has been addressed by other people, but that's diet. It, it's kind of common sense um, that you want to have a healthy diet, as we all do, whether we have a, a neurological diagnosis or not. It's important to be conscientious about trying to <clears throat> uh, keep a healthy diet, maintain our weight as best we can. <clears throat> one of my patients was recently talking about the the COVID-15, that, that you know, people are acquiring additional weight while they're staying home and social distancing and so forth. And I, I do hear it from my patients, not just those with Parkinson's disease, but you know, I saw people earlier today or yesterday who've told me that they're gaining weight because they're staying home and they're eating more, I suppose, with less physical activity. But I think having a healthy diet and the Mediterranean diet has been brought up in the past and it's been looked at in terms of people with Parkinson's disease as being potentially beneficial. I'm not saying one has to follow a strict Mediterranean diet of eating uh, olive oil and completely avoiding uh, red meat. Uh, but having a, a, a conscientious sense of, the, of their diet, I think is also important, not just for Parkinson's disease, but for optimal health in general. So those are really the points I wanted to bring up. Uh, I'm happy to have a further discussion about that as, as time permits, but thanks for allow me to participate. I don't have a fly in my head, do I? You'll let me know if I do. Uh, we'll let you know, I promise. If we see a fly on okay. anyone's head, we're going to let you know. That's the kind of friends we are. So there you go. Uh, that's awesome. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Hermanowitz. Um, Karen, do you want to share some thoughts about things that you've found that is just kind of really, you know, looking at those four things, things that have kind of changed your life experience as you navigate this? Disease sure. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, my husband, Rob's had Parkinson's for almost 20 years. And one of the things that we found that works best for us uh, to get the help that we need um, is to go into our uh, doctor's visit really prepared. And uh, we, we start talking about it usually a couple weeks before we even meet with the doctor. And we make a list of what we're going to talk about and we start considering those things that are uh, issues in our lives right now and and then uh, these are things that we really need to address in the in the meeting with the doctor so it might be things like um, are, are you either of us experiencing grief or sadness um, are we feeling like life's not worth living um, anxiety apathy is rob just sitting in his chair in front of the tv or is he getting out and doing his exercises um is he drinking his water uh we live in a desert here in santa fe so it's important that you stay hydrated um you know what kind of uh exercises are he is he doing and um are they uh, having a good benefit uh, we look at, is it, has tremor been a big issue lately, or, or is it the dyskinesia? And if it's the dyskinesias, um, sometimes I'll even video them so the doctor can see exactly what is going on and has a real good idea of, of what that looks like and what he's experiencing. And I've also found that uh, keeping a chart and I list all the hours of the day and uh, the days of the week across the top. And we'll put in uh, when he takes his medication, when the dyskinesia symptoms have kicked in, um, whether he's uh, used medical cannabis, which he was for some time. And uh, taking that chart along with the video and taking that into the doctor's office really gives the opportunity to uh, give the doctor all the information that they need. 
And we also recently added one that's really made a big difference and that's quality of life issues. And what would Rob like to be doing that he's not able to do now? And how can we make that happen in his life? And uh, in April, having that conversation with Dr. Hermanowitz uh, resulted in some big medication changes for Rob. And uh, my husband is a songwriter and um, musician and, uh, you know, plays the guitar, the, the keyboards. Um, and uh, he hadn't really been doing that for years. And he hadn't written a song in seven years. And I'm so pleased to say that with these medication changes that came about from this discussion with our doctor, he has written like five songs in five to six songs recently. He's back playing the guitar on a regular basis. Um, he's in there singing. He's happy. It's made a complete, you know, 360 from where we were in March. Uh, everybody's not going to have that result, but Asking those kinds of questions, I think, are key to getting our lives back. Thanks for letting Thank me you. share. Thank you. And I think, you know, I, I would like, I want to hear Dave, and then I think it's a worthy conversation to really talk about quality of life. I think it's one of those things that we can overlook. And it's um, something that, right, it can be a direction. It can help with the direction of where you want to go with all four of these aspects. So that was really powerful. Dave, do you want to share? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, Dr. Hermanowitz mentioned um, uh, uh, being, uh, finding the optimal combination and moderation. Um, that's one of the points I wanted to make about exercise. It's an old expression, moderation is the key to success. I mean, I've had, I'm now in my 22nd year since being officially diagnosed. And I've been pretty much, I was pretty active before that and um, before I was diagnosed and I've been very active since. And I don't think there's any question that the exercise makes a key difference. It, to me, it's, it's another, it's like another drug, another prescription, but you have to do it in moderation. You can't be told to exercise and go out and run 20 miles type of thing your first day and then you're so sore the next day you don't want to do it again. Moderation is, is the key. And, in, and it's like when you're in high school, they don't, like, they don't like a kid to major in, they like kids to play different sports to get different, exposed to different things. It's like that as an adult too. You want to try different exercises, whether it's running, swimming, boxing, jumping rope, whatever your, your thing is. You know, some, and it's fine to have different seasons. Like, you know, you don't have to, be a, a diehard runner for 12 months a year, unless you're, unless you're a competitor type thing, but, but try different things like swimming and boxing and um, um, cycling and spin bike. I, I'm, I'm back on doing my spin bike now. I haven't done it in a while and I'm doing a spin bike now and it's, it's a lot of fun to get back into it. Um, boxing, of course, has caught on. The Rock Steady program has caught on like wildfire in recent years and uh, that's, been kind of derailed a little bit right now, but but you can still do boxing stuff on your own and online. There are plenty of classes. You can go to places like PD Buzz and you, you'll find list of classes that you can take in your area. And um, there's, the, the other key is to, to do it with, if you can find somebody to work out with, that makes a big difference too. You know, it's, it's hard to get self-motivated every day, but when you have someone pushing you and kind of pulling you along, you know, that, that's, that's great too. Um, these days I'm, like I said, I'm going back doing spin biking. I do, also do yoga a couple of days a week. I do um, ballroom dancing lessons. I uh, do, like I said, yoga, I do um, boxing workouts and, and then I'll bury it sometime. So it, again, you don't have to be totally dedicated year round to the same exercise put some variety in it and it'll make a big difference. Yeah. The variety, and I love what you had to say about doing it with someone because then you get the socialization too. It helps push you to, to do it and to stay consistent with it, but there's also some social connection, which I think exactly. is- That's just as important to me a lot of times as going, doing the workout. And when, you, when I find, I'm sure it's like this for most people, 
when you're working out, you eat, you tend to eat better too. You, you know, you, you, don't, you don't crave the cupcakes anymore and the, and the piece of cake as much. You, um, you, you enjoy the fruit and you tend to drink a lot more water. I notice when, when I don't work, when I take a break and don't work out as much, I, my diet tends to follow along and, and not be as good. So I mean, it, it, one feeds off the other, no pun intended, but the diet feeds off the exercise and, and vice versa. That's actually a great point. You're right. They do feed off of each other. And I'm, I'm curious, um, and if any of you, one of the questions that was put in the chat is how can people with Parkinson's and I'll say even care partners, you know, connect with each other to exercise together. I'm interested in hearing kind of all of your perspectives about either ways you've done that or recommendations and ways to do that, especially during these challenging COVID times. Well, the, 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 the biggest thing is one, one thing that's helped has been your programs, Sarah, that have kind of these, we've kind of learned, we've kind of met a lot of the same people and you, we've connected with uh, people on, through your programs. But in your local, find, you know, a lot of areas have local websites. Like in our area, we have PD Buzz that lists the um, different groups and it's, it's, it's a way to find other people in your area to, um, to work out with. Absolutely, so, so absolutely. Support, support yeah. groups are, if you join, catch on with a support group, support groups are one of the best ways to meet people right now. It is, and there are online support groups. If you're trying to find an online support group, you know, please let us know. We can help direct you. That's the good news, even if there's not, even if your local group may not be meeting, um, locally online. There are online support groups. And just so all of you know, if your local group isn't meeting online, but there's an interest in that, we will help get you online. We are able to provide a Zoom link for you so that you can get online. We will do everything we can to make that happen um, You know, for you. D did you have something else to add to that, Dr. Hermanowitz? Well, you made, a, you made an excellent point at the outset saying don't overdo it if you're just getting started. And I've had several patients over the years who did overdo it and they pay a price for days afterward and it also discourages them from keeping it up. So you start, you know, you start slow at a short, short interval of time and then gradually increase the exercise amount. And I think getting, getting the social connection, I think through support groups is a, is a great way, but there are other organizations that are probably now meeting online as well, you know, astronomy clubs or whatever, whatever other interests you may have, uh, you can probably connect to people uh, that way as well online. It's hard to meet new people, especially in a, relatively new to Santa Fe. And I are, you know, we're staying at home and we're not meeting uh, people that we don't really know too many people here in Santa Fe. Uh, so it's, it's hard, but I think getting connected in, what, in whatever interests you uh, would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a question um, sent privately to me, um, and it was around the time when you were talking about tremor and the fact that that actually can help, that can lead to some people isolating. And the question was also, uh, was about dyskinesia. And I think maybe there's a question, you know, it might be good to explain the difference between the two for people who don't know. But I think, um, you know, Dr. Hermanowitz, Karen, and Dave, I think you guys all probably have stuff you can share about that, but I think this is worth talking about because it doesn't get surfaced very often. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think the dyskinesia probably is also as socially uh, isolating as tremor, actually, and both, unfortunately, tend to come out in social situations. Uh, the uh, dyskinesia that I see here when I'm uh, when people come in for their visits, and I'll ask, are you having dyskinesia at home? And they'll often say, uh, not so much as I have here when I come in to see you. I guess I had that effect on, on people. But it, just in social situations, dyskinesias tend to come up more, which is unfortunately inhibiting again for people to go out. Another reason that people, I remember one of my patients years ago, he was a very, he was, you know, he was the life of the party. He was a very uh, big personality, sort of the, the, the main speaker at a table full of people, but his voice sadly was affected uh, by Parkinson's disease. And that he told me that is what and his wife told me too. That's what kept him at home more often. He didn't want to meet with people because um, he he felt that he couldn't be heard. People would be leaning across the table to try to hear his voice. But getting engaged in singing groups and practicing your voice in a social setting 
may also be helpful for that and allow people to overcome that sense that well I, nobody hears me or I'm you know they're they're uh, they're not waiting to hear my uh, joining in to the conversation because of voice problems. That's a really good point, Dr. Hermanowitz, because I know um, with my husband that uh, prior to his starting doing all of this singing, his voice was getting very weak and I found myself constantly saying, what, what? And he, of course, thought it was my hearing and I had a hearing test to show him that no, it's not my hearing. Um, it's how you're speaking. But now that he's been singing, you know, uh, sometimes for an hour a day, uh, his voice is very definitely much stronger. That's great. That that singing really that and and it helps. It helps everything, doesn't it? I mean, it ex, it's actually exercise too. It's core strength exercise, um, voice. Yeah. yeah, it helps with, you know, swallowing issues, um, you know, uh, diaphragm, breathing from the diaphragm. Uh, it, it's you got a, a wealth of, of good stuff when you can sing. Yeah. Right, right. I'm going to just list a few things. There's been a lot of really great ideas that have been shared in the chat, and I want to share some of them with you. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing some, but um, I've seen in there the laughter yoga. That's another great thing. Um, boxing, as Dave talked about, um, brain yoga, a brain yoga app. Lauren, you referenced that, I think, that you like the brain yoga app. Is that free, Lauren? Oh, I'm sorry, maybe. Oh, I'm sorry, Becky. That's okay. Okay, okay. it's free. It is free. Yeah, and it's got memory stuff and word games and spatial puzzles that you can do. Um, it, it's got a lot of good stuff on there. Wow, brain yoga. That's really cool. Okay, yeah. so we'll check that out. Um, and I think Lauren put that in the chat. Um, somebody else just talked just about music. I mean, listening to music is also really good. Um, it's a good, it's a healthy thing to do. Uh, let's see. Somebody did say that, um, while drinking martinis out of a martini glass can be tricky with the tremor. They taste just as good out of a mug. So there you go. And, um, somebody else mentioned if they exercise, they tend to feel better for the rest of the day. So they just feel better overall, but if they exercise and Dave, you mentioned the ballroom dancing. Um, which I know you do, but I think that's really cool. And you're doing that online, right, Dave? Well, I was doing it in person before this pandemic hit. Yes. But, but it was more, it's obviously, needless to say, more fun, much more fun in person. Yes. But, um, especially with a partner, but but doing it on, doing it on my rug in my office it, online isn't quite the same. But it's the best we can do right now. Right. But um, we're hoping to actually go back in this in the actual studio soon. Uh, depending on uh, if we if, if we're here in California, if they continue to, to to improve, but um yeah, the ballroom dancing is fun. It's different. It's not something I ever would have imagined myself doing, but it's it's fun. It's good for the balance. It's good for coordination, and it's good like everything else. It's good. For, it's great. For, it's a great social exercise. That's probably the the best part about it is the social part. But I was going to say too, the, the exercise also helps you sleep better. I, I find that it's easier to fall asleep when you when you're exercising, and you sleep tend to sleep better. So that's another benefit of it. That's you're right. It is. It helps you sleep better, which is a really big deal. I think you're going to say something, Doctor Manowitz. No, I'm just I'm just looking at the names pop up, and I, I happen to see an O W I C Z that. Uh, also, oh, I love uh, that. <laughs> got my attention uh, somebody else somebody else mentioned music and i've had several patients in the past and, and currently who are um, sometimes they've been professional musicians and uh, pianists guitarists and they say that their skill set has declined uh, dexterity is more difficult in fretting the guitar or playing the piano for example but i i would encourage people to maintain that even if they're not uh, as skillful as they once were uh you know uh, I play guitar occasionally, and I'm terrible. Uh, but I and, and, and I, I've talked about this with my, with some of my patients. I still try to keep it up every once in a while. I think it's good exercise for a brain, you know, the brain hand uh, connection. 
there is something I think, at least for me, and I think for many people, unusual about music, how it has a positive effect on our sense of well-being. Uh, so I think singing is not just good exercise for the voice, but you know, in, in the past and, and still online, uh, it would bring people together. And there is something uplifting about the act of, of singing, e even if you're not great at it uh, necessarily. Not all of us are, uh, are an opera singer or uh, such, but I think it's a good thing to do. I couldn't agree more. And somebody asked um, about this singing. Somebody said that they went through LSBT Loud a year ago, but their voice has deteriorated since then. Um, is there formal therapy for singing? Or anything that, from your experience? Uh, well, there, yes, uh, that has been looked at a bit in the past, but mostly it's been the LSBT, the Lee Silverman vocal uh, technique that has been most prominent in terms of trying to address voice issues in people with this diagnosis. Uh, but but in, and I have to say music therapy, which I have not looked at lately, but I have looked at in the past. And in my last job, there was some effort on that on campus. Um, I, I think it's a good thing. And if you talk to artists, uh, one of my, the daughter of one of my patients in the past was a vocalist and dance and, and she you know, and still is uh, active. Um, and I would love to bring her out to Santa Fe. <laughs> uh, and I know she has a connection here, used to it, you know. But I mean, she really had a very firm conviction about how, about art, voice, movement, dance uh, has a an overall impact, not you know, on spiritual well-being as well as physical well-being. And I think that probably has been underestimated and probably understudied in the past also. Mm -hmm. We have a, a choir uh, in, in Santa Fe, uh, Parkinson's Choir, called the Parkinsingers, and they meet twice a week uh, virtually. It's not the same as when they used to meet in person, of course, but uh, we have a great choir director that leads them through the motions and uh, the singing, and um, it definitely makes a difference in strengthening the vocal cords and strengthening the, the voice overall. Um, and I found uh, that for people who have um, difficulty being heard, in other words, they just don't speak loudly enough. Um, in addition to uh, voice therapy, there also is a new device that's come out called Speech Vive, V-I-V-E. -E. And uh, it's something that you wear in your ear uh, and it, it projects the voice out, if you can believe it. I mean, uh, it's quite interesting. Their website is speechvive.com and there's um, a, a little video there that you can see the difference before and after but it is also another way that if you've had voice training um, through uh, parkinson's voice project or something like that and maintaining that is just too onerous for you this would be something that uh you know that i believe it's medicare approved now that um would be able to help you at least with that projection of the voice mm -hmm. yep speech mm -hmm. vibe that's great. Thanks, Karen. Uh -huh. um, go ahead. You want to say something else? No, that was it. Okay. Um, <laughs> somebody, this one's kind of funny. Somebody said that her husband is tone deaf and it, there's suggestions and then somebody said earmuffs. So um, that's kind of funny. So humor is another really good one, by the way. Um, <laughs> somebody asked if you can repeat the four points. They missed one. I'll repeat them. So again, the number one was, I'm not saying it's, it's the top one necessarily, the most prominent one, but uh, judicious use of medication. And that's in a collaboration discussion with my patient and their caregiver. Uh, exercise in a form that they enjoy doing, so they'll keep it up. Social connection, which I think is uh, really imperative. And also intellectual engagement in some form. Um, and I think in these exercise groups, you can check most, if not all, of those boxes, actually. You, you get, uh, well, the, not the judicious use of medication, but you compare notes with other people about their medications. You certainly get exercise in you know, rock steady boxing or other exercise groups. Ballroom dancing would be great. Uh, social connection is de definitely there. And I think the intellectual en engagement is, is bound to occur in some 
fashion. I mean, it's hard not to talk about what's on the news these days. If you get together with one or more people, uh, it, it inevitably comes up. Uh, hopefully that won't lead to more boxing or throwing a punch. <laughs> <laughs> Social but distance, think, keep the distance, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but, and I also mentioned diet as being a, a, another, a fifth important point. Great. And, you know, so there were two things that just kind of came up in that, in that brief thing that I think is worth, worth discussing. Um, one person put out there the socialization. They missed their parties, but it was difficult to go to parties and potlucks because it was hard to hold things and, you know, the spilling potentially, whether it's holding, actually just holding while you walk around or on the lap. Um, and I'm wondering if, um, you know, Karen and Dave, do you have any strategies that you've found that have, has helped with that for people? Well, typically for Rob and I, we are, you know, if it's a social event like that, we're, we're, we're typically going together. And I, uh, he will find a place to sit um, that's comfortable and it kind of in the mix. And then I go get the plate and, and bring him his plate uh, of food because it is difficult for him to go through like a potluck line and try to hold a plate and serve and be using his walker. So it's just almost impossible. So we've just worked this out where he finds a comfortable place to sit. I, you know, go and get the food, bring it to him. And, um, it, and it has just worked out that way he can, uh, I know he's taken care of. And then if I want to go off and mingle somewhere else, I've got that opportunity too. And I know he's engaged and, and uh, has his, his food and stuff. That's great. Dave, how about you? Any thoughts that you have on that? that you've found for those strategies so that you can still, you know, be social? Yeah, I, I would reflect some of the same stuff Karen said, except that I usually go by myself to these functions and um, I, I have to, I try to plan it out too. Uh, you know, I'll, I'm selective on which foods I'll eat. Like I, I won't get spaghetti or something like that. Otherwise the spaghetti's going to go flying probably. But um, I, you know, I try to plan out my what I'm going to get, where I'm going to sit, you know, where, try to make sure I have a place to sit after I get my food so I don't have to walk around with it if I'm at a buffet type thing. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to scout out where the bathroom is, you know, where the where the bar is and stuff like that. You, you, you have to plan things out a little bit more and kind of think of the little things that normally you wouldn't think of. What am I going to do in this, you know, if I drop my food or something? And uh, it's just little things that you most people wouldn't think of having to worry about. Right. And I think, too, like utilizing Zoom is another opportunity um, that, you know, it's, it is a way that you can actually sit at the table. You don't have to carry things and you can still, so, uh, you know, socialize with other people. Um, Zoom, you know, Zoom has a variety of ways that you can connect. Um, and it might be a time to kind of take advantage of, of that kind of socialization. I know I've talked to some people who set up, you know, regular um, times with people um, and are able to kind of keep that connection with people. But I think one of the challenges is setting that schedule. Don't you, did you guys find that, you know, before COVID, the schedule mattered a lot, right? So your schedule for your exercise, all of those schedules that helped you kind of push past some of the apathy, I would think, and help keep moving. Um, and I think it's harder to keep a schedule like that when you're home because, well, because we're not being forced to do things as much. So that accountability, and I think Lauren mentioned that, um, that accountability by having a schedule or set times with people can help with that. Um, I, I agree yeah. totally. I mean, when before the pandemic hit, when I was doing rock steady four or five, four days a week typically, and I'd get, and we started at 7.30, and I was in the mode of getting up at, you know, six o'clock or so to take my meds and, and get down to the gym. But now I find myself still sitting up at, a, you know, 12 o'clock, one o'clock in the morning, watching the old, old highlights, the old, old reruns of Twilight Zone and stuff. And, and, um, and I, I find and I've hard sometimes I have a harder time getting up in the morning, so it's it's definitely affected my schedule. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and for our, our support group here in Santa Fe, we used to meet monthly. And uh, when COVID hit, we decided to start meeting weekly so that we could have that time together to socialize. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'll bring in a speaker. Sometimes it's just let people, you know, talk about what's important to them, what kind of things they're going through. Um, we've, we've even brought in a grief counselor because some, some, for some people, there was really a lot of grief around not being able to go out to a restaurant or go to a movie or see their friends or go to rock steady boxing in person. And that's really, I think, helped people to, um, you know, weather this completely bizarre situation <laughs> that we're going through. Uh, Rob and I have a pretty strict regimen. We go walking every morning, you know, before breakfast and just make sure that we get it out of the way that way. <clears throat> Such a good point, Karen, like to uh, to have that regular schedule. I love the walking and Lauren mentioned like get up when you get up, put on your workout clothes so that you actually get your mind in that in that mindset. And Marsha, we unmuted you. I'm wondering if you can share. You've been a real inspiration uh, for me as I've heard what you've been doing um, for keeping your socialization up. Could you share a little bit with us, Marsha? Well, for one thing, um Three of my school friends, college friends, whom I haven't really kept in touch with that much, um, meet every Saturday now and we on Zoom. And we just have a great time just chatting. And um, one of them lives here in New Mexico, one in California and one in New York. So, you know, it's really a, a different, I mean, a really different, fun thing. And then George and I have had a, um, a weekly meeting with um, several friends and to talk about politics and things like that. And um, so, I, oh, and my daughter and I Zoom frequently, and that's been just sweet. It's been so nice, much nicer than the phone. She's in Virginia and I'm in New Mexico. So anyway, those are some of my ideas. Those are great because you bring up a good point. There are opportunities to connect with people maybe that you haven't connected with or you know, you used to maybe do phone calls with. Can you change that to Zoom? We know Zoom is not nearly as nice, of course, as being in person. We all crave that and wanna be in person right there with people, but it is closer than um, than being on the telephone. And I'll tell you, as an organization that works entirely um, remotely, um, we've been working you know, remotely for years now. Um, in fact, our, our five-year birthday is tomorrow. Um, so, um, but we've been working remotely for years now. And I'll tell you, over time, there's some of these, some staff members I have yet to meet in person. Um, and I've also found the ones that I have met in person, I feel like I've known them for years by the time I see them. It just feels like an old friend. Um, so you really can still build relationships. It just takes a little bit um, more intention to be able to do that. Another piece that you guys brought up that I kind of want to circle back on a little bit, um, I think, because I think it's worth a conversation. You know, we do a lot of um, presentations about different medications because we're passionate about making sure people know what the medications are that are out there. Um, and we've had some conversations with people who have said, you know, they still struggle with figuring out how to have that conversation with their doctor. And um, so we're, and we're always thinking, okay, so we can tell people what medications are out there, but I think there's a synergy place with doctors and a synergy place where you can share the vulnerability. And I know Dr. Hermanowitz, you and I have had conversations about the concern about the people aren't sharing as much potentially with their doctor, especially related to quality of life. Now that we are in COVID, there's kind of a shutdown of sharing. And I can, I'm concerned about that. So, um, and I think, I'm just wondering if you guys have any insight, thoughts, experience that you can share with us on that. Well, I remember, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. oh well, I just remember years ago um, going to a doctor's visit with Rob and the doctor saying, well, how have you been doing? And his first response was, oh, just fine. 
And I just looked at him like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so, I mean, I think there's uh, uh, sometimes um, uh, a, a reflex, just like, oh, we're doing just fine, but we're not really getting down to the real issues that are going on. And that's why if you have a care partner, uh, the care partner, you know, taking the opportunity to observe and say, I've seen this lately about what's going on. Um, do you think it's something we need to talk to the doctor about? And even if the person with Parkinson says, oh, I don't know if I've, I feel comfortable sharing that, the care partner saying, um, well, I would really like us to share that because I feel strongly about it. Uh, I think that because when there's a care partner involved, it's a team and you really have to work together to get the kinds of results that you want to have in your life. Agreed. And I've, I've had that experience myself. I, you know, usually I'd be walking in the room and now I'm putting on gloves, but in the past I'd be going to the sink and washing my hands, I, you know, just as a greeting. Hi, how are you? Know, how are you doing? And I would get that same response. Hi. Um, and then the spouse, which I hope would be there uh, as well, you know, I would see them kind of go oh, or gasp inside. And I would say, well, that, you know, we'll talk. <laughs> because, I, you know, if people were just fine, they'd be someplace else. They wouldn't be sitting in the room, room waiting to talk with me. Uh, I think it's really important for spouses or care partners to come along to these visits because, you uh, you can get a different perspective and sometimes people forget about something that happened that the uh, care partner uh, will recall and it, it's just really good good to get somebody else's feedback about all sorts of topics and I think that plus I want everybody to be on the same page as you all know this affects not just the person with the diagnosis but their spouse or care partner as well so it's important that we all talk one of my patients here just recently said well do you mind if my husband comes with uh, no i i want them to come i'm uh, it makes me uneasy when a spouse or care partner is not uh present uh and it makes me sad when a person doesn't have a spouse or a care partner uh to help along the way and even a friend right if they don't have another person they could you know if they don't have a spouse or care partner bring a friend like there's a lot that goes on in a doctor's appointment for any of us um yes. right yeah right and there's so much to remember. We talk about so many things. And I, when I'm giving instructions to people about medications, for example, I write them down, or sometimes I write down other things as well. You know, who can remember all these things? Uh, by, by the time you get to your car, well, what did they say? Uh, what, you know, what, when do I do that? Or, so it's very helpful to have another set of eyes and ears along with you uh, to sort of digest the visit as well. One thing you can do is um, you can ask the physician if, if he or she minds if you record the, uh, the, the meeting, you know, just audio, at least just the audio, record the, the conversation that you have. So especially if you are by yourself and if you can record it, then you can play it back later. Because I know I'm guilty of that, especially if I go to a non-neurologist. And when I go to a neurologist and the topic is Parkinson's, then that's fine and feel more comfortable. But when I go to other doctors for, for non-related things, just like my G GP guy or my cardiologist or some, sometimes you, you don't, you're not paying attention to what he says because you, you're trying to hide your Parkinson's symptoms and you just want to get through the, the meeting and you just are through the appointment. So you tend to miss some important things the doctor might say. Well, and I've heard from uh, some uh, care partners because I also, um, facilitate a care partner support group that uh, in the doctor's office, they can not even be acknowledged sometimes by the doctor. And I find that very concerning because uh, if the care partner is there, they should be included in the conversation and actually looked to uh, and asked, well, what do you think about that? And originally when we lived in Portland, um, we went to Oregon Health Sciences University 
and uh, as you were waiting for your appointment, the care partner received a sheet of paper asking them a lot of questions, including about depression and anxiety and other things. And the person with Parkinson's uh, received a, 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 a similar list asking all of a, a lot of those same questions yeah. so that the yeah. um, care partner from the very beginning of that is in that conversation. And, and actually they should be because the Parkinson's ex ex affects everybody in the household. And um, if it does it right now, it will probably at some point down the road. Yeah, we refer to this, it's a, it's a team sport. Whoever's on your team, it's a team sport. And like any team, you need everybody to be able to work together. So, you know, I saw one comment of what do you do if the, you know, if the doctor doesn't acknowledge you, I think the synergy matters a lot. Um, and so, you know, I always, I always say to people, it's okay if you need to find a new doctor or yeah. try to have a conversation with a doctor. It's okay if you need to, we all have different personalities. So everybody looks for kind of a different person. Um, you know, but to Dr. Hermanowitz's point and, and Karen's point, there are a lot of doctors, movement disorder specialists who will and actually value that kind of shared input. Um, you know, and if you're ever struggling with any of that, you just feel free to um, reach out to us and we can, we can help you um, kind of track down. But I think, you know, the synergy with the doctor matters. Um, mm -hmm. That also can carry over to um, the nurse practitioner or the physician's assistant, whichever the case that you see, because that's very common. That, like in my case, I, I more often than I see my nurse practitioner more than the, the actual doctor, but and I'm okay with that because she's fantastic. I think and yeah, she, she'll listen to me. She gives me all the time I need, and she'll listen to my to my you know situation and so forth. And I never feel rushed, and I'm more than happy to work with her. So. Absolutely. Many, many, many practices are including nurse practitioners, physician assistants now. And that's right. They oftentimes have a little more time than some of the doctors do. And there can be waiting lists. But again, feel free to reach out to us at any time. We'll help you think through some of these things if you need. If that would be helpful, we'd be happy to do that. Somebody asked about mannitol. Um, I must admit, I don't know mannitol. Mannitol, a uh, sugar that uh, is sometimes, it's used for a variety of things, but it can be used for somebody who's got a lot of stool backup. Okay. Uh, uh, so is that like a Miralax? It's not exactly the same as uh, Miralax, uh, but com similar uh, actions. Okay. This of action. Okay, wonderful. Um, I am gonna ask everybody now to go to the chat and I want you to put one thing in the chat that you do, whether it fits under the intellectual, the exercise, the social, and, the med and or the medication. Um, one thing that you've found in the last, let's say week, that you've done that has helped with one of those things. And go. Yeah. Rock steady boxing. FaceTime with the grandkids. They're a hoot. I like that. Maria loves cheese. I want to know what kind of cheese you love. Play piano, rock steady boxing. Play piano. That's really good. Talk about fine motor movement. Tai Chi, yoga, speech therapy, dancing. Play the music loud and sing loud. I love that, Peter. Um, Qigong practice. Playing piano. Oh, see, I knew a good. Oh, the metronome. That's good. I'm reading this, by the way, for people who are calling in. Swimming, Peloton, Zoom book club, songwriting. That's a great idea. That's cool. Parkin singers, texting with old friends, exercise, eating more cashews. That's a good one. Everybody loves that. Restricting the online. That's a good one. If you start feeling stressed and anxiety, don't go online or watch the news. Don't do it. Watch a cooking show. That's so much better. Uh, water aerobics, boxing, writing a book. These are great art therapy. There is so much resilience in this community. I am continually inspired by the resilience, the creativity, um, and you know, I just think it's, it's amazing. And there's so much we can learn from each other. So if we find ourselves in a place where we're just saying, you know, I don't know what to do. I can't get out of this, you know, slump. 
let's reach out to each other because there's a lot of resilience. And I, um, I think we might just put something together to share with you with these great ideas. Um, and then also, please remember, you can always visit our website. We have lots of information on our website. I'm going to take just a minute to show you. Um, now I have to scroll back up. Uh, because we have a listing of all of the virtual support groups on our website now too. And I know that I was sent that link, but it was earlier on. It might even be in the chat. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see it. And if you haven't visited our website, I encourage you to do that. We've got lots of information on here. But um, the exercise and wellness does have where there are, um, where there are uh, virtual programs. And remember, you can browse by state. So we have programs from all 50 states on our website of exercise and, um, and also support groups. If you look on here and you don't see your exercise program or you don't see your support group, um, you know, then let us know because we're happy to add it under find a support group. Same thing. You'll be able to go on here. You look under your state. So obviously Alabama has th more than three support groups. So you have to view all groups from that because there's a lot of information kind of embedded in here. So you can do that. If you're trying to find a doctor, one way you can uh, look for a doctor is building your medical network. Now we don't have every doctor listed on here who's a movement disorder specialist. We do have uh, about 150 movement disorder specialists and advanced practice providers. That's the NPs and physician assistants. But you can also click here and you will go to the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society. And that's where you can actually put in your address or your zip code and find out where a doctor is nearby. So do that and, um, and absolutely stay connected to us. We've got lots of information in here. We want you to be um, engaged. If you're trying to figure out how to have a better conversation with people, with your doctor, here is the snapshot of a communication tool. The Empowered Communication Tool will help you identify different symptoms and help you do a little snapshot for your doctor. And we really encourage, to Karen's point, have the doctor have the care partner fill it out, have the person with Parkinson's fill it out. Both of you can have a conversation about it. And then when you go to talk to the doctor, what a richer conversation you will have. And that's always available on our website. Um, let's see, I am thinking we're gonna wrap up here too. Uh, this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all of your ideas, everyone, and Dr. Hermanowitz and Karen and Dave, uh, thank you so much for sharing, and, and Lauren and Marsha as well. Thank you for sharing um, your insight and your wisdom with us. It, it's very inspiring. So I just one, one final comment. Somebody brought up mannitol. I was just yeah. looking into it because it, it can be used for constipation. It's also used to try to reduce brain pressure, but apparently there's a study in Israel looking at how it may interact with alpha-synuclein clumping. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, so that's something else to, to keep in mind. Oh, interesting. See, so there's like hope out there. There's a lot learn, of- really learn, learn something every time I do one of these uh, kind of uh, programs. Isn't that amazing? I love that. Any final little words, Karen or Dave, for you? No, just thanks for inviting us. These programs are always so helpful. I just love them. Uh, just um, keep, keep a sense of humor. And remember, it's okay to have a bad day, but then get up and get back in the game the next day. That's right. Thanks, Dave. That's very good wisdom. We hope to see you guys tomorrow. We're going to have a program about a new medication. We've had some requests for people to view that. And then Thursday, we're going to have a really great program talking about um, medication tracking tools. So um, looking forward to seeing you all there and thank you for joining us. Let's do the wave and thank all of our wonderful Dr. Hermanowitz and Karen and Dave for taking your time to share this with us. Many thanks. Good to see everybody. Good to see yeah, you. Thanks for inviting me.